We left off at the last segment of um, Abram's life in the beginning of chapter 13 of Genesis. And what he has is a promise from God. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and I'm going to bring you into a land, and I'm going to call it your home, and you're going to be there, and I provided this for you, now trust me. But when we get to chapter 13 and 14, the next two chapters are really a development of one idea. And here's the idea. There's a way to spread blessing. There's a way to be generous with what God has been generous to you with. So if chapter 12 told the story of how he squandered the blessing and left Pharaoh worse off than he found him, then 13 and 14 are going to actually do the opposite. They're going to tell a positive story. And I, for one, would like to have a positive story in my life. So I want to talk about some, some secrets to spreading blessing. There are five of them that you'll find in 13. And then we'll go on to 14 and kind of pick up the story. But, but look at this. In verses 2 through 4, secret number one for spreading blessing, know the source of generosity. In other words, you're willing to give things to other people when you know God gave them to you. When you know the source of generosity, it's easier to give it away. If you think you earned it, then you're going to fight to keep it. But if you think God gave it to you, you'll hand it away. Has anybody ever given you like a really cool something that you were able to give away to somebody else and feel good about? At any rate, um, look at verse 2. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the, at the beginning between Bethel and I, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. He went back. He saw where God had given him blessing. He bowed down before the Lord. He opened his heart again, and he went back to where the source of his blessing came from. Because he knew the source, it allowed him to have a generous heart and to, to nurture other people with that. Now, the interesting thing is that um, Abraham had physical blessings, but if you ate this morning, so did you. If you have clothing in your closet, God has blessed you. If, if you can look at your life and see a lot of things in it, let me just tell you, you didn't earn them. God gave you what you have. God gave me what I have. You're going to think I'm weird, and I'm okay because I'll risk being weird, okay? I get in my car almost every day, most days, and thank God for letting me use this car. There's a reason I keep my car clean, because it's the Lord's car, and I'm trying to keep his car nice. I know that sounds weird, but I want you to start looking at the things in your life like they belong to the Lord and you get to use them. If you will stoke that up in the fire of your heart, you will be a better person. Things will happen in your life. God will entrust to you more because he knows that what you're using it for is what he wants. I want you to look closely at the, at the process in the verses. Look at verse 2. He took his fortune to the Negev. That's the place he chose to go after God gave him the land of the north. And, and surrender to God preceded generosity that was fruitful. In other words, give your heart to God before you give your stuff to God. That's the first thing. So he comes back and he puts himself down before the Lord because he's got to give his heart before he, his stuff even matters. Submission to God of personal comfort also has to go on the altar. It's okay for God to put me in a situation, Abraham says, where I experience lack. That's all right. Paul said it this way. I've, I've learned to be content in whatever state I am. It, I, I've learned to be content when I'm hungry. Let, let me ask you something. How many Christians have, know how to be content when they're hungry? I am cantankerous when I'm hungry. Get out of my way when I'm hungry. But, but Paul knew how to be content. I, I want you to see that sacrifice for God preceded generosity that bore fruit in his life. It's interesting to me because um, the physical has to be set in the spiritual. If you get right, God put this in my hands, then you'll use it with the right spirit because the material things are set inside the context of their, the, 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 physical, uh, the, um, the spiritual things. Okay, let me give you a second one. If the first secret is know the source of generosity in verses 2 through 4, 
The second secret is understand the problem in verses 5 to 7. Understand the problem. Verse 5 says, Now Lot, who went with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling uh, then in the land. Okay. Do you see the problem? Abraham's going to get a test to his generosity, and he has to understand the problem. Because generosity and other person-centered living are not the norm in our world. Taking care of other people. What made Mrs. Jacoby so weird is that she was willing to give the guy 10 bucks. What's, what's strange is people are self-centered in our world, and that's what causes strife between us. That's what James 4.1 says. Where do wars and strife come between us? They come from the warring of our members because we're selfish. We want to consume things on our own lusts. The fact is, it's not a lack of physical wealth that leads people to steal. It's a poverty of the soul that leads people to steal. A disconnection from God and moral character that's rooted in knowing him. So here's the bottom line. The bottom line is when I understand where my, my um, blessings come from, and when I understand the problem of the world that I live in, that's going to set me up well to be able to be used of God to bless other people. There's a third thing I have, a third secret I have to know. It's in verses 8 and 9. I have to see problems as opportunities to be generous. I have to see problems as opportunities to be generous. So somebody around me is going to pose a problem. And when they pose the problem of a lack somewhere, I'm going to have to turn around and say, that problem allows me an opportunity to be generous. Now, let's, let's see it from the life of Abram. Lot said, uh, Abram said to Lot, verse 8, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, I will go to the right. If to the right, I will go to the left. See, look, generosity is acts that are based on the deliberate intention to help the other person gain. That's what makes it generous. Generosity means I'm helping the other person gain. I got to tell you something, and I don't know if uh, you, you might all know this, and it might all be obvious, or maybe you don't. I don't know your experience in ministry. Can I just tell you that when it comes to ministry, the number one thing the enemy does to, to break up ministries is jealousy. Do you know how many ministries are jealous of other ministries? And here's the funny part. I live in a town where we have a specific function in town. Let me, let me show you one of the ways to get away from jealousy. Have a function and know what it is. I think that there are some great evangelists in town. And I've told you before, I'm not particularly good at it. I function in a role of making disciples and in the training of the Bible. That's my role. But that means down the street, Dustin might be reaching people left and right and having people saved every Sunday. I don't. I'm not worried about that. I happen to know that when Dustin wants to have somebody in his youth group discipled, he sends them down here. I have a role, he has a role. Todd's got a role. Steve's got a role. Dave's got a role. These are all my friends and they have different churches doing different things and it's okay with me. You know why it's okay with me? Because my, my um, evaluation of myself is not based on how many cars are in the parking lot. My evaluation is whether or not today I'm doing what God told me to do. If you just make that your issue, all the rest of it goes away. But if you're going to run around trying to be more popular than the other guy or bigger than the other guy, then you're going to be all about the wrong thing and jealousy is going to come in and it's going to creep in and ruin your relationships with other people. The truth is, I'm fairly amazed people show up Sunday. The most amazing thing happened here 11 years ago. It wasn't that they came the first Sunday, it's that they came back. Stop looking at it like you've earned it. Look at it like God gives you what you get. And you do the best you can, and then God gives you stuff, and how cool is that? Get in, get in the car and say, God, thanks for letting me use your car. When you pray, 
How many of you honestly, when you pray over your food, it's so perfunctory, it's kind of like, da -da 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 -da, God bless us for our body, da -da 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 -da, bing, God's neat, let's eat, you know. Stop for a minute. Before you pray, for the next couple, just stop for a minute and say, Lord, am I really thankful that you provided this? Now, it might be spinach and maybe you're not, but maybe it's ice cream and maybe you are. Stop and say, Lord, I don't, I have what I have because you're good to me. You're really good to me. Do, do you know where I'm going with this? There's a certain arrogance that believers have, like they deserve to have more. I, I am so moved. L look at Abraham. He just says, look, take the right, I'll go left. Take the left, I'll go right. You take what you need. I, I'm okay with that. God will take care of me. The thing is that Struggles are either obstacles or opportunities, and you have to decide how to turn the obstacles into opportunities. Um, let me give you a fourth secret. The fourth one's in 10 and, 10 and 11. The fourth one is this. Lot lifted up his eyes. He saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. The fourth secret is delight in the progress of the other. You want to break the stranglehold of jealousy? Delight in the progress of the other. Get excited when the other ministry grows. Get excited when the other guy grows. Delight in what God is doing in other places because, because you don't deserve what he gave you and they don't deserve what he gave them and, and that's not what it's about. If my, Look, what's good for Sebring and its churches is good for us. If Jesus is moving forward around town and they're growing at twice the speed we are, praise God. Somebody's reaching somebody. Somebody's growing. I, I love this because Abraham is energized by the progress of his nephew. By the way, don't, don't miss that Moses is the author here, right? He's the writer. And so how does he describe places? Oh, you know that place in Egypt we used to live? He's writing this in the desert after they've been on the Exodus. And so he compares every place to Egypt because that's what the people know. That's what he grew up in. So it's, it's kind of funny. Nothing kills a generous heart more than the venom of jealousy. Nothing kills a, a generous heart more than the venom of jealousy. Years ago, Canon Camera, does everybody know what Canon Camera is? Um, back in the dark ages, back when we had like TV sets. Um, children were used in an experiment about generosity. The, the children were placed by themselves in a room with a plate of cookies. On the plate were at least two cookies. There may have been more, but one of the cookies was very large. The adult left the room and the kids were allowed to take a cookie. You know, they all took the big one. Well, one boy was challenged as to why he took the biggest cookie. Alan Font, who used to be the show's host, told the boy, all you left me to eat was the little cookie. I would have eaten the little cookie and, and given you the biggest one. Without a blink, the boy responded, then you got what you wanted. <laughs> uh, generosity is a tough thing to learn. And most of us, honestly, most of us. My mom used to have a rule. I don't know if your parents had this. My mom had a rule with my brother and I. One person cuts it in half, the other one gets to choose the first piece. You know what? When you have that rule, you would be, we had micrometers. We were exacting. You're not getting one crumb of pie more than I got. I mean, scalpels, we got surgical masks were in there, you know, because we are just desperate. Where did we get this fairness streak that came out when we were two? They're like, it's mine. And anybody tries to get any more, you know? Okay, here's the thing. I really see that Lot lifted up his eyes. He saw this beautiful place. And there it was. He goes and he chooses this. Abram's not mad at him. Abram's not going, oh man, you chose the good one. In fact, Lot cho chose what seemed to be best for his view of prosperity, not based on the character of the people who lived in the place. Because what did he choose? Sodom and Gomorrah. Stay tuned, they've got their own story. So he chose it, why? Because it looked easy, because it looked blessed, because it looked beautiful, because it looked fat and full. He chose a flat place that looked more settled. He chose a place that looked like it was a great blessing, except for it was an incredibly turbulent place. 
What looks easier is often built on the foundation of a very dangerous place. You don't choose by what looks easier. But he didn't know yet. And Lot's going to grow through the process. All right, let me give you the fifth secret that's found here. It's in verses 12 through 18. And this one is, fifth secret to generosity, see God's promises to you as a continued source of your happiness. In other words, get your happiness from what God is saying, not from what you're doing. Get your happiness from what God is saying. See, God's word, God's promises as your continuing source of happiness. And I see that it's in verse 12. Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled in the cities of the valley. He moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated with him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for the land which you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land, its length, its breadth, I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt in the land of the oaks of Mamre, which is near Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to see. In chapter 12, the first promise to Abraham was given. Do you remember where in chapter 12 it is? Go back to chapter 12 and put a box around the first promise God made to Abraham. Somebody tell me where you're doing that box. Uh, what does it say? And I will make you a great nation, and will bless you, and make your name great, and you sh so you shall be a blessing. Okay, put a box around that, and put next to that box, number one blessing. Because he's going to have repeated blessings that are expanded over time. Okay, then after you do that, right underneath of it, right there where that first box is, put C, chapter 13, verse 14. See, chapter 13, verse 14. Because number two promise is going to be 13, 14. Now go to 13, 14. And where it starts to say, now lift up your eyes, all the way down to the end of verse 17, put a box around that and put number two next to it. This is the second promise of Abraham from God. Everybody following what we're doing? So God is going to expand the promise as time goes on. The first promise to Abraham was, I will make a great nation of you. He didn't, he didn't know that until God said it. Then he said, beyond that, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I will take you into a land and I'll give it to you. Now, what's the expansion? Tell me what's in chapter 13, 14 to 17 that isn't in chapter 12. What's new in the second promise? Land. Okay, do you see anything about land in chapter 12? I'll show you the land. I'll, show, I'll you. show you the land is in 12, but in 13 there's something more about it. What is it? In 12, it's I'm going to take you there and show it to you. In 13, it's look this way, this way, this way, this way. That's it. You're there. So in 12, it's I'm going to get you there. In 13, you're standing on it. Okay? Now, what else is in chapter 13? He also describes a little more in depth how he's going to make him into a great nation. Okay? But he says something about that great nation. You're right on the edge of it. Hey, that's like a triple-A corner over there. Three A's. Oh, never mind. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so I'm just saying. Um, what does he say about his descendants and the land? They get it. <coughs> What's that? They get the land. How long? Right. Underline descendants forever. At this point, you have a game-changing statement of God in the story. So... Is it true to say God promised the children of Abraham to have that land and have it as a piece of land and it's specific north, south, east, and west of where he was standing and that it's forever? Now that's either true 
or this passage is not true, or it means something totally different. Spiritually, it means something like, you know, I don't know, something beyond our comprehension. I think it's pretty simple. He says, look this way, now this way, now this way, now this way, look around, see that? That's yours, it's your descendants forever. Now that's an expanded promise. And what I want you to see is we're going to come back to this promise. Frankly, the Middle East is still worrying about this promise. So it's important that you understand how the promise developed and where God gave it and what he said. Because you're going to get into a Bible study and somebody's going to say, yeah, but God made us all children of Abraham and those promises are all done away with. Forever! That's what it says. Forever. So before you decide that God doesn't do it forever, you might want to look at what he said. So Abraham got a divine endorsement of blessing in light of his generous heart. Notice that the whole thing was after he gave to Lot what he wanted, God gave him an expanded promise. Why? Well, because we're never so tall that we can't stoop to help others. Okay? And, and when we see God's God's promises as the continuing source of our blessing, we're able to give away what we have. How can you give away what you have? It's easy when you know that God will supply all you need. And what's interesting is what, what moved Lot was the city filled with uh, men that were not following God. What moved Abraham were the promises of God. What moved Lot was what looked easy. What, what moved Abraham was God's promises. The, the question of generosity is how you look at what God gives you. So roll it quickly over into 14. You're almost done. You guys are doing great today. I, I want you to see that you can spread blessing. And I want you to see that you can do it. You, you have a platform of these secrets. Now, get down to 14.1, and here, there, a problem arises. The problem was in Lot, not in Abraham. So I want to take a moment, and I want to move the story. Right in the middle, 13 is going to give me a story about generosity. I'll use a dollar sign for generosity. And it's going to give me a... But right in the middle of the story, there's a, there's a player in the story, and that player is Lot. I'm not leaving Abraham's life. I'm saying that in the mini-series on Abraham, one of the episodes was mostly about Lot. Does that make sense? Don't let that throw you off. By the way, this is going to come back to you because in David's life, we will have whole segments on Saul. But it's not leaving the story of David. It's in the context of one mini-series, okay? So here's what I want you to see. In Lot set up his own problems. Look at 1310. He chose by what looked good. He chose what was unwise. 1313. What should Lot have done in 1313? What happens when you look around and you realize the people are all wicked? Yeah, you know why? You don't just leave because they're wicked people. You leave because you're going to raise your kids there. You've you got to determine the stage of the life that you're going to build. You decide to hang out with wicked people, expect it not only to affect the way you think, but to affect everybody you bring into the situation. So, they un uh, what, one of the things that happened is in 14, 1 to 12, there's a story. And the story is about Sodom and Gomorrah and the kings of the plain and a battle. Okay? Follow it really quickly because I'm not going to tear the story apart. I just want you to see 14.1. Came about in the days of, of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Eliasar, Chedor Omer, king of Elam, Tedal, king of Goyim, that they made war with Bera, the king of Sodom, and Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, Shinav, and king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these as allies to the valley of Sidom, that is the Salt Valley, 12 years they had served Chedol Omer, but the 13th year they rebelled. Okay, here's what I want you to see. Sodom and Gomorrah unwisely chose the people to fight. They backed the wrong people. They were involved in a league of allies that were bad people. They got along with each other for a period of time and then they didn't. And what I want you to see is the big guns in Shinar, Elisar, that's modern Iraq. Can you see that word, Elisar? That's modern Iraq. 
uh, Elam, that's the Persian Gulf in western Iran, and other nations, Goyim, that's the east part of the five cities of the Jordan River, and um, the small powers chose to pick a fight against the big powers. That's what he's saying, okay? Cut through all that. Here's the thing. We're a couple of little cities, and we, bless you, we, because we're a couple of little cities, but we hang out together, we start puffing ourselves up and think we're stronger than we are. Too many words. One of the problems we have is sometimes we hang out with people so long that we believe that we really understand something because everybody we know agrees with us. It doesn't mean you're right. It just means you need more friends. Okay? Sometimes you just don't have enough people in your life to give you more balance to what you're saying. So what can seem right to everybody in the room doesn't make it right. It's one of the reasons I like, frankly, hanging out with people who disagree with me. I spend a lot of time in crowds that are not believers and in with groups of people that do not agree with me. Um, I spend a significant amount of my time in the gay community. Take, take it from me, it has nothing to do with anything I feel. What it has to do with is I want to know how they're thinking and how they're feeling and what they're saying. And I want to know how they understand what we're saying. I spend time with agnostics and atheists and I do it sometimes online, sometimes live, and I do it so that I can understand their arguments better. Here's the truth. These guys backed the wrong horse. They thought they could get up and stand against bigger powers. But they unwisely not only chose the people to fight, they chose the wrong place to fight. In verses 5 through 9, it sets up that the Gulf powers decided to come down to Canaan and to, and to push them into North Africa and swung around through the wilderness of Sinai and Paran and up into Transjordan. And the four eastern kings lined up against their own city. They saw them coming and they had sufficient opportunities to stop their advance, but they didn't do it. And in 1410 to 12, they made the total wrong defense plan. If you put any notes next to t uh, 10 to 12, put this. Stupid defense plan. They had the dumbest plan ever. Listen to this. The valley of Sidim was full, full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. Hello? They live there. Listen. I can understand when people come into an area that they don't know how they could fall into a pit. I don't understand how people who live there can. How many of you honestly are, are you're so good at your bedroom, at back home, that you don't have to open your eyes to get to the bathroom and you will miss all of the furniture. You know exactly where everything is, okay? You can get all the way into the, into the bathroom without bumping your toes into anything. You know how to maneuver. You can sort of feel. How many of you have walked into your room and you reach over to the wall and you know right where the light switch is even though you can't see anything at all? Have you done that? Later on in life, you'll spend a lot of time driving and you will get to places and you will never remember driving there. Have you ever done that? You got all the way there, you don't remember driving there. You, you remember the song you were listening to, but you have no idea how you, I mean, you know you didn't run down like, you know, a flock of geese or small children, but you don't know how you got there. These guys lived there and fell into their own pits. Now that's pretty stupid. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Oh, great. So if you didn't fall into pits, then you ran into the hills. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the food supply and they departed. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. Apparently, Lot didn't get the memo that we're about to get squashed like a bug. So he's sitting there when the army takes off and they come by and they take the city and they take him away. It could be that he went out to fight, but it doesn't say that. It just simply said they took him and he was living in Sodom. I usually put a word in the text in my mind. Now, I'm not telling you to write this in your Bible, but put it in your mind. For he was living in Sodom cluelessly. I want you to, I want you to understand that bad company corrupts good morals. That's exactly what 1 Corinthians 15, says. Bad company corrupts good morals. Paul said, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Here's what he said to the Corinthian church. Stop hanging out with people that sin because you're sinning. And I, I, I'm trying to get through to you that hanging out with the wrong people will get you the wrong results in life. Hello. I mean, seriously. I, I'm amazed at the number of people that walk in my office 
clueless that things were going to go wrong when they hung out with all the wrong people. Let me very quickly, in the moments we have left, I want to just show you how the story folds out and shows you some points of focus that expose grace of God in my life. Here's some points of, I'm going to give you six quick points of focus for the grace of God in your life. This is a story about how God works. Now here's the thing. How do you offer grace when you could throttle the guy or the gal who did the dumb thing that got them into the place? The story in 1413 goes back to Abraham. Guys, this isn't a story about how stupid Lot is. I mean, it is, but that's not really the point of the story. You know, I, you know, I want you to go home from Sunday school and go, you know, Lot is stupid. Now may the Lord add his blessing to the meaning of his word. You know, that's not going to do it for you, right? The rest of the chapter is about Abraham again. Now, you want to know what's hard? What's hard is being generous when the other person's stupid. What's hard is being generous when the other person has squandered. You gave them the choice land and they just blew it all. You gave them everything they wanted and they just messed it up. Now, how many of you, honestly looking at your own life, would say, at this point, I would go, and if I were Abraham, and if I found Lot, I would go, <laughs> you idiot. Is there anybody else who would be tempted besides me to go, thou fool, <laughs> this night I will require your, your soul of you, you know, and beat the living dead. How many of you honestly have the reasonable temptation to kick the person when they're down, when they managed to get down because they were stupid? Okay, that's the story. How do you show grace when the person is stupid? Well, the first thing you do in verses 13 and 14 is focus on needs over lessons. Needs over lessons. What do I mean? The heart of a Pharisee is geared toward making a point rather than helping a hurting one. But the heart of a generous person is toward helping the hurting one before making the point. When your friend's down, it's the wrong time to give them a lesson. A guy's um, walking along and he falls into a hole. And uh, a priest comes along and he says, Father, can you help me out? I'm stuck down here in a hole. And the priest writes a prayer and throws it down in the hole and walks on. And the guy's sitting there with this prayer. And a doctor walks by and he says, Doc, can you help me? I'm stuck down in this hole. And the doctor writes a prescription and throws it down in the hole. The guy's bummed out. And a little while later, his friend goes walking by. He goes, Joe, can you help me out? I'm stuck down here in this hole. And lo and behold, Joe jumps in the hole. And he says, what are you, stupid? I'm stuck in the hole. And he goes, yeah, that's okay, because I've been in the hole and I know the way out. The point is that what a person needs when they're stuck in a hole is not a lesson. They need help. And so in verses 13 and 14, I love the verse at the end of verse 14. He went in pursuit as far as Dan. You have to know how far that is. He went the whole pick and length of the country all the way up to here. He, he chased after him. You, you need to know. Abraham said, all right, let me get a posse. We're going after them. And he went a long distance at great personal expense. I want to say something to you. And I, I don't know if you're going to really grasp it all in one time. I'll say it later in the year again. Here's the phrase. Love and justice run opposite each other. If you want justice, you don't want love. And if you want love, you don't want justice. Whenever we cry for justice, we're not crying for love. Whenever we're crying for love, we're not crying for justice. Love and justice run opposed to one another. If, if God gives me what I deserve, I'm not going to experience his love because what I deserve is eternal destruction. If God gives me love, I'm not going to get what I deserve. It works against it. Okay, first focus. Focus on the needs over the lesson. Second focus is in verse 14. Focus on opportunity over schedule. What do I mean? When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken, he led out his trained men born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. In other words, Grace saw the emergency and the rescue and said, I don't need to check my day timer. Drop whatever I'm doing. I need to go help them. Guys, listen to me. 
When your mama is dying, you don't care if you ate. You'll sit next to her at that hospital bed and it doesn't matter if your hair's good. It doesn't matter how long you've been sitting there. It doesn't matter if you stink. You're gonna sit right there. You're not leaving her side because it matters to you. When it's an emergency, everything else goes distant. Let me give you the third one. The third one is you focus on possibilities over problems. Possibilities over problems. This is verse 15. Possibilities over problems. Look, look what he does. So Abraham divided his forces against them by night. Nobody, by the way, in this time fought by night. Abraham is pulling a stunt that nobody's done. So he, fought, he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is to the left hand of Damascus. It's to the north of Damascus. That's the phrase I told you where the left hand is. See, grace requires not only action, it requires creativity. Sometimes you're going to have to, you're going to have to really think hard, how can we do with a little something that's up against something much bigger? You know, walking with God and within his promises doesn't mean you can walk with the presumption that you don't have to make a plan. Abe is doing a plan here. He's got something going on. He actively led the men. Did you, did you see that? He didn't send them, he went with them. He took the risk himself. And in his ingenuity, he outsmarted the opposing army by doing what they didn't expect. And that was a nighttime thing. Okay, let me give you the fourth one. The fourth one is to focus on influence over immediate response. Influence over immediate response. That's 16 and 17. Influence over immediate response. It says he brought back all the goods, also brought back his relative lot with his possessions, also the women, the people. Then after his return from the defeat, Chedor Omer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, and went out, uh, Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva. That's the king's valley. Here's the thing. Grace expands it always focused on expanding the work of God in people by reaching their needs. Abraham wasn't just going to get his lot and his stuff. He was going to make a name among the Gentiles of his day. Abraham had a long-term objective that had to do with people. So he wanted the influence with people. I want you to be careful to understand something. God always, always is about people. And the generosity of Abraham could be trusted to be a magnet to draw people toward God. Verses 18 to 20, this is the fifth one. Focus on offering praise over receiving recognition. This is not a small one, this is huge. Focus on offering praise over receiving recognition. Grace seeks to recognize the blessing and purposes of God when they show themselves. Abraham offers a tithe that says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, Abraham, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Most of you only know about that passage because of the word tenth or tithe. And there's a whole debate about tithing. Here's what I want you to know. This has nothing to do with church tithing. Abraham didn't give from his own flocks. He gave from somebody else's. This is a tenth of everything he collected, but it wasn't his stuff. You can't make the argument that, well, giving before the law was tithing, and so tithing is what believers should do. The guy's given somebody else's chickens, not his own. Then he goes and he rescues a group of people and gives a tenth of what he rescued to somebody else. That's not his. The point is that he deliberately chose to focus on attention of the other man's status. So literally, he honors Melchizedek. By the way, do you know what the tenth or the tithe was? This is money you pledge to a king of a region so that he will protect you. Okay? So when you pass through Florida, the king of Florida would take a tenth of everything you have, and all the time you're in Florida, he is responsible to protect you, and the price of that was 10% of what you brought in. Now the problem is what you don't want to do is a 10-state journey, because when you get to the end, you won't have anything. And you'll still have a little bit. It's actually 10 plus a little bit less, plus a little bit less, plus a little bit, but you understand what I mean. 
theoretically, you can end up with one goat, okay? I mean, you know, which is really depressing when you start with a flock. At any rate, you, you understand what I'm saying. Last one, sixth one. This is 21 to 24, and this is... He focused on eternal clarity over temporal benefit. Eternal clarity over temporal benefit. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear that you would say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Aner, Ashchol, Mamre, let them take their share. See, a man of grace was able to be a testimony by giving no misunderstanding about what his intentions were. Okay, I wanna stop here for a second. You're almost done and I really want you to see something. Um, when you offer the gospel to somebody and then you turn around and invite them to your church, do you know that a lot of people think you're just doing it so you can get more people in your church? Do you know that a lot of unbelievers end up feeling like you're trying to get something from them, not give something to them? That's the reason I tell you that whenever possible, lavish people with things that you get nothing from. Because the best way to become um, a spokesman for God in their life, a gracious spokesman, is to help them and don't look for anything. And if, if God gives you something, fine, but you, you don't look for anything. You can do it in an office. Take a job, go into that office, show up early, stay late, and do extra. Don't look for pay, just do it. Become the person that everybody counts on there. Job security by making yourself indispensable. What, what Abraham did was he, he looked at what the needs were. He put himself on the line and he gave himself to it. A couple of hundred guys going after an army. Crazy. Split up in the middle of the night, went and attacked. Crazy. God blessed. Not presumption, God blessed.